Welcome to the Woman Warriors Podcast, where we're working to help you call a truce with your anxiety. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Now, here's your host, Elizabeth Cush, LCPC. Welcome back to the Woman Warriors Podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Cush, and I am a licensed clinical professional counselor in Annapolis, Maryland, where I'm doing all online therapy right now due to COVID, and will continue to do so probably through the end of the year. If you live in Maryland and are interested in working with me or finding out what it would be like to work with me, you can schedule a free 15-minute phone consultation and you can find a link to do that through my website, progressioncounseling.com. If you're just a listener of the podcast and you just want to get more episodes all the time, you can subscribe to the newsletter and have new episodes delivered directly to your inbox. You can also find a link to that at my website, progressioncounseling.com or womanwarriors.com and sign up for the newsletter there. Today, my guest is my sister, Clifford Henderson. I'm really excited to share this conversation. Uh, Just so fun to talk to her for the podcast, but also I learned a lot about improv. And uh, even though I have taken one of her classes, um, I learned more than I expected to. So how about that? And today you're going to find out how improv can be a sneaky form of therapy. So stay tuned, listen in, let's get started. Hi, Clifford. Welcome to the Woman Warriors podcast. Well, it's a delight to be here. So full disclosure, Clifford is my sister, so it's super fun to have you here on the podcast and, uh, you know, so easy to talk to you because we talk all the time. Exactly. (laughs) And a, a crazy thing that our lives in such a um, unusual way have wound up overlapping. I know. In terms of our professions. It's true. It's true. But it's, it's, well, I think it was probably necessary for both of us to find our paths these way in this, in this way, but also very cool that they overlap in this way too. Yes. Right. Yeah. So if you don't mind telling the audience a little bit about you and how you, what inspired you to, to the work, to do the work that you do? All right. Well, for starters, the work that I do now in particular is I run an improv school with my partner and wife, Dixie Cox. It's called the Fun Institute, and it's an adult school. The journey started through just um, more traditional theater, where I started studying theater and did that for years and years, and uh, has, has morphed into this over over time. Um, what got me into theater to begin with was, uh, I, I believe a need to be heard really, and a need to feel seen. Mm. Um, uh, and the, uh, this feeling that I think I see so many students come to us now with this same feeling of just needing to step up to themselves in some way. And, and as I said, to be seen and heard. So, um, Mm. And I think that's that's where it all began. Yeah, uh, I have now been seen and heard a lot, and, <laughs> and that desire isn't there so much. But I continue to um, love the work. I continue to love it both as an art form and with the Fun Institute as a community builder and a place where we see people heal. Really, so that has become really, I would say, my biggest focus. Yeah. with the kind of work is the power that it has over helping people transform their lives. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. Well, yeah. well, and two, you you and yes, I want to talk about that for sure, but two yeah. to recognize and honor that you're being seen in other ways through your writing and storytelling and authorship too. Yes. Oh, yes. Well, yes, I'm also a novelist. Yeah, I have um 
five published novels. And uh, yes, and that is, it's also wanting to be heard, but in a very different way through my, what has become my passion for language and just finding the right words to express something, telling other people's stories. I initially, (laughs) this is funny, I hadn't thought about this till right now, but initially when I started writing, I wanted to write the stories of what I thought of as invisible people. I didn't want the big Hollywood stories. I wanted stories about the people that we don't notice, the regular Mm, people. Yeah. So I wanted to make them be seen. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, so, yeah. I mean, yes, just the everyday person story. Yeah. 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 Everybody's got a story. Everybody. We used to teach with the Fun Institute. We don't anymore, but for a long time we had also a solo performance uh, part of our school where people, a little bit for those that are familiar with the moth, uh, similar, mm-hmm. but people where they had, uh, we gave them, it was an eight week class. And on the eighth week, it was an invited audience. And every member of the class had 10 minutes on stage to perform what they had worked on. And, uh, it again was this sense of creating story and realizing for me, that everybody has a, has multiple stories. Everybody, yeah. you know, there and stories worth telling. Oh, so yeah. it's changed the way I go through the world now. You know, you pass somebody on the street, and I just think, I wonder what theirs would be. You know, <laughs> what their ten minutes would be here. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's that's interesting too, because that's something that I try to impart to clients is that we tend to. Th- see the world through our own story, which of course, but that we also make assumptions about what other people's stories are often in regard to ourselves, like, oh, they're judging me or, oh, they hate me or whatever story you're telling, right. but that they have their own story that we don't know. Right. They might not even ask. be thinking about you. <laughs> right. Right. It's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so, yeah. I think that's very, very true. Yeah. And yeah. often we are not the stars of other people's stories. They are their own stars. <laughs> <laughs> Just like we're our own stars. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for people who might not uh, really understand or be familiar with uh, improv, improvisation, could you explain a little bit about, yeah, what your classes are like, but what, you sure. know, what the students go through? Yeah, sure. Um well, improv, how so many people think about improv through the uh, TV show, Whose Line Is It Anyway?, which sort of brought it to um, television. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is certainly, it is making things up on the spot, uh, but there's lots of different forms of it and um, n- not all quite so, uh, I, I mean, I like what they do, but it's very you know, it's made for TV. It's made to be funny. Right. And not all improv has to be funny. Um, but people come to our classes. Most people come to our classes, uh, not with the idea that they want to go on stage or be famous, although some certainly go on to do it in different ways, um, in that regard. But uh, most people come to our class. In fact, phew, so many come in and they say, this is my biggest fear is coming and being on stage, first of all, and being on stage without knowing what I'm going to say or do. Mm. That's like this ter- the terrifying void of that. And so our classes are um, building skills of being able to be in that moment and have tools for that moment of not necessarily knowing what you're going to do next, but not being afraid of that feeling. Mm. So, uh, it's, it's uh, like, I took a dance class years ago and, uh, the teachers, I said, how do you ever keep, like we were spinning. I said, how do you ever keep from being dizzy? She said, you never stop being dizzy. You just get used to the feeling. And Mm -hmm. I think that that's really similar with the work that we do. Cause basically what we're training people to do is to build scenes or stories together. It's a collective art form. Mm-hmm. So, uh, like, and, but there are a lot of steps to that. And one of the things is being able to trust your own spontaneity, being able to trust who you're playing with, being able, one of the biggest things that we're teaching people to do 
is being in the absolute moment of what they're doing, which means really listening to their partner and really responding to the last moment instead of thinking about something sentences before and you stop listening to them. And so you're responding to something else or you're responding to something that's like a trigger for you Mm -hmm. rather than really hearing what came from them. Yeah. So and the listening is both physical and audible. You know, you're watching them, hearing how they're saying what they're saying, but also seeing how they're saying what they're saying. So it's really an art form of um, awareness. Yeah. It's it's learning to be aware and especially being aware under stress, because when you're on stage, it creates like a pressure cooker because any thoughts you have that people are judging you come highly to the surface your own come to the surface oh yeah you begin to judge yourself and so how to handle that moment you know like what how you can put your own critical mind aside and say hey talk to me later yeah we'll deal with this later Mm -hmm. i need to be here in this moment now yeah what's going on so so much of what we're doing is just teaching people to be in the moment and not try so hard just be there if you can just be there, and oddly enough, that is maybe the hardest thing to learn for people. Oh, my I gosh. Say, I, that. Yeah, I would say. And what we're teaching people to do, like at the beginning, we start in a circle, so there's not a lot of stress. It's, it's an exercise that's, you know, you're taking turns in a circle or going around the circle, but you're not in front of everybody. Everybody, and, and nobody can come watch our class. If you come, you've got to do it so that everybody's on the same sort of threshold of risk. Mm. And uh, so we go around the circle. Maybe we're uh, making a sound that everybody has to make or or um, doing something physical that everybody has to do. Or There's all kinds of silly. And these are mostly silly games just to get people laughing and get people to get their guard down and to get their voice activated and get them breathing. Because uh, one of the things that we say is if you're on stage and you feel like you're dying, you probably are because you've stopped breathing. You know, <laughs> it's like you really, the breath is huge, you know. So just all those things, getting people to just get in their bodies and just feel what they're feeling in the moment. And then we move on to partner exercises so people can try things out without everybody watching them Mm. and, you know, practice a particular skill. And sometimes like some of these exercises are like, if you're going to play a scene and by play a scene, I mean, just two people having a conversation really is what a scene can be as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in order, like one of the biggest challenges for people is not to think ahead, to think of what they're going to say that's going to be funny or great and not to get stuck with uh, in the past of going, oh, I should have, I could have, mm-hmm. and to be right in the moment. And like uh, just an example of a game that that might be is there's one where when you speak, you have to use start your sentence with the last letter of the last word that they said. Mm, wow. So which for spellers, they're like, ah, and we're like, if there's a silent E or not, don't worry about that. Nobody's correcting each other's spelling. Go for it. If you don't know the right, you know, because we all I'm not a great speller. So I, I sympathize deeply with people that panic about that. But take a guess what you think that last letter is and start your sentence with that. So you really cannot plan ahead. In mm. that moment. You know, you've got to listen Till they have uttered their very last consonant, you know, and yeah. then you can go from there. And it gets people in the moment because you've really got to listen. And listening is by far the biggest skill we really teach people is how to listen with their bodies, how to listen with their ears, how to listen with their eyes. Mm. Listen, listen, listen. Yeah. So then we do that all in partners. And then, you know, we get people and there's a lot, there's a million different partner exercises that are all based on different skills, making the eye contact, things like that, what it feels like to make eye contact. There's one where we have two people stand about three feet away from each other. Oh, hold and, on. Another one. Yeah. Welcome <laughs> to that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the downside of living in a city. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The upside too that they can get to you quickly if you oh, need them. True that. True yeah, that. I mean, that's yeah. With all the fires out here, shit. Oh my gosh. People that are getting it are the ones that can't get to them. 
Hmm. Which is why they like living there because it's remote. But ooh, yo, yo, yo. True, true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So right. another exercise that we might do, just to give examples of the kinds of things, is two people standing about three mm. feet away from each other. And they're making eye contact. They're holding eye contact, which that by itself for some people is very difficult. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's just holding eye contact. And as they hold eye contact, they we guide them first to look into like as imagining that they can look into the person's soul through their eyes. Hmm. And we get them to do that. And then we get them to continue making eye contact, but pull their energy back into their own body. So they're scanning their own body while they're maintaining eye contact. Hmm. And we get them to go back and forth between those two things and then try to find that middle place where they see the other person and they have full awareness of themselves and go, that's where you want to be right in between those two places. That's cool. Yeah, it is super cool. And it's a light bulb for a lot of people, you know, like, are you just totally aware of yourself and not paying attention to them? Or is all your attention going to them and you're not paying attention to yourself? Like, yeah. you know, being present with both. So those are the kinds of exercises. We have like a zillion of those. And then once we've gone through those and people are starting to laugh and have fun, then we people have the opportunity. Not everybody has to do this, but most by now are laughing so hard and having a good time that they do. And we get them up on stage and give them particular tasks that they have to do on stage in front of people. And uh, by then the pressure cooker's on because people are watching you. But um, one of the things that we always say about improv, which is uh, taken from a man named Keith Johnstone, who was wrote an amazing book called Impro. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, improvisers are good-natured people willing to fail in public so that you, you have to just know that you don't have to be afraid of failure, that that's where the humor often comes, and that you just have to embrace it. And mm -hmm. so giving people room, because that's everybody's biggest fear, I think, is yeah. failing. Sure, sure. So that's an idea of what we do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And just... It's interesting because the way you're describing it, 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 like from my perspective, so much of it feels like therapy. <laughs> well, yes, we teach, um, have taught for, I don't know, 11 years or so at Esalen Institute. And uh, so we get a different group of students down there. And a guy once who was a therapist stopped mid-exercise one time. He was in front of the class doing something. He stopped. He said, wait a second. This is sneaky therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it is, though. Yeah. I mean, yes. being in your body, breathing. I mean, this is all like sort of the mindfulness stuff in therapy that I'm teaching people. But too, like not getting caught up in the 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 critical part of yourself, allowing yourself to fail with compassion. Like so much of that is I what I hope to impart with my clients. So. Yeah. It's just putting it on its feet in a different way. I think there's a million different doorways into the same thing. So and, many, uh, so many. Yeah. But yes. this is for some people that this is particularly effective for whatever reason, because we see people change, you know, and sometimes it takes a while for people to change. They keep, we keep getting them up there. And then one day you see, they start really listening. We're like, yay, they're listening. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're, they're noticing what's happening. Yeah. So. Yeah. And and for you personally, has it been therapeutic teaching oh. as well as oh, being hell an Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. Improv has taught me it has that along with my practice in yoga have been my two biggest teachers in my life, really, yeah. Yeah. I think. And and uh improv definitely because my fear of being, you know, being thought stupid and all that has gone away. My, um, oh, I, I, if you know, just trusting other people, trusting mm -hmm. myself, mm -hmm. uh, playing. It has been a huge, there's a whole thing with, um, improv too, that again, is a Keith Johnstone thing that he came up with the idea of status of, which is like the human pecking order. And as an improviser, what you want to do, and I think this has been one of my biggest lessons, is, you know, that we are all at some times in our lives 
low status in a situation where we don't have the power. We are all sometimes high status where we need to take the power to take care of whatever needs to happen. Um, what happens is you just don't want to ever get stuck in either one of those places. You want to be flexible and be able to move through them both and realize that it at, isn't actually about who is more powerful. It's who can kind of move most effectively through life. And, and I'm not explaining it well just because it's such a big thing. But Yeah, huge concept. But it's yes. a huge concept, yes. but not to let your triggers get in the way of getting what needs to be done, get done. Yeah. You know, so if, if you're dealing with somebody that you see is attached to high status, you're never going to win. So you can, if you don't challenge their status, you're more likely to get what you want. Women are particularly good at this. I hate to say that, but yeah, they're good. True, true that. <laughs> drop, yeah. Good at dropping status to get what they want because they know that they're not going to get it by challenging the status. Well, you know? because so, that's what we've had to do for millions of years or whatever. Millions of years. Yeah. <laughs> right, that's right. how we've learned to do it. And, and yeah. people say, oh, well, it's manipulative. Well, it's just another form of power, really. Mm -hmm. But so, um, and sometimes there's a situation where you need to step up to high, somebody, you know, that room where, well, who's going to lead? Who's going to lead? Well, somebody needs to lead or we're not going to move on. What's it like to step into that position and say, well, I'll do it. You know, I'm, I'm willing to fail, but I'll do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's been a big lesson for me too. So yeah, there have been so many lessons. Yeah. So, and yeah. so, you know, you had mentioned just before this, that you've seen, your students grow? I mean, typically, do you have students that stick with you for multiple rounds of classes and come back and continue? Or is it kind of a coming and going thing? We have both. We have students that have been with us for 20 years, mm -hmm. who just are addicted to the art of it. Because once, once you kind of do it, it's just fun. It's yeah. just super fun. Yeah. Uh, then we have lots of people who just drop in, get something from it and move along. So it's, it's really both. It's really both. And those that stick with it, like what sorts of growth do you see? How do you see it helping them in their sort of daily, whatever, struggle, triggers, mental health stuff? Okay. So if you think about this, if you're playing a scene and the scene is requiring you of you to be somebody that you don't think you are, you know, you don't think like, like sometimes a scene might require somebody to play this um, terribly mean person. And you think, well, I, I am not a terribly mean person. Mm -hmm. But in the scene right now, for whatever reason, it feels like so you get to explore that side of yourself mm -hmm. without real consequences, because actually uh, the person that you're playing across from wants you to be that because then they can play <laughs> whatever their other, part is, whatever their part is. Yeah. Yeah. And so you see people expand in terms of who they are, what they realize is possible for their, for their personality. It's like piece of people's person, people get more colorful, mm. they get more expressive, they get sort of bigger in who they are, I would say. Over yeah. time. Yeah. You I was going to say, you get comfortable with all those different parts of you. Yeah. You get to try them out and you could get, you can get to kill somebody and they don't really die, mm -hmm. you know, and you go, oh, wow, that would be crazy to do that. And the person doesn't, in fact, you've just given them this fantastic opportunity to play a long out dr death scene that's so fun for them, you know, coughing and sputtering. And you gave that to them. It's play. It's like children play. It's like children, children do this naturally. It's yeah. how children learn. They say, you be the mommy, you be the daddy. They figure out all kinds of stuff that way. And I think it's just adults embracing that and saying, let's play together. And again, you just grow through it. You become more proficient at everything. Mm, yeah. I And just as you were describing at the beginning, really learning how to be with yourself you know, with others too, but like that truly listening, tuning into your own body, sort of being present, but not so tied up in your own stuff that you're not really paying attention to what other people are doing. Yeah, 
Absolutely. And if for some reason a scene is making you uncomfortable, you find tools how to move move away from the discomfort. You go, I don't want to go here. Mm. You get tools. For, oh, I could do this. Oh, I could like every moment in a in a life, every moment that we live has a million different ways it could go. Mm. And we get stuck thinking, oh, this is the only thing that can happen right now. Never, 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 never. I think is it the only way something could happen. Yeah. There, you have a infinity possibilities and it starts getting people thinking that way i think that oh i can shift this way or shift that way or da, da, da. yeah so. yeah yeah it gives you the the space to pause and reflect on how you can do things differently yeah 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 so, very yeah. cool very cool yeah. so uh i know you know, I know I've thought about this. I know you and I have, you've shared articles with me about, you know, improv as a therapy, uh, you know, being brought into therapy. But I, it's, what's interesting for me is that I never really thought about how directly parallel they are. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's amazing. No, it's amazing. How direct. And more and more. I mean, we just, somebody just sent me an article. I mean, people always send us improv articles. Apparently they're bringing improv into medical schools to get doctors to be more, mm -hmm. um, compassionate and, and better communicators. You know, the, wow. the, the business world has picked it up a lot of getting employees to do it and team building and just to get people to be, easier with because I, I guess that's I mean I, I'm not a therapist but just getting people easier as they travel through the world I would think would be one of the goals that it's not a painful experience but that it's a yeah. joyous experience you yeah. know or yeah. can be yeah that you can be comfortable in yourself with whatever might come yeah yeah exactly that yeah. you have the tools to deal with it yeah yeah so yeah cool. yeah so Clifford, how do people find the Fun Institute? How do they find your books? How do they find you? Okay, well, the, the Fun Institute can be found through funinstitute.com. That's our website. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, we are, we're located in Santa Cruz, California. So, uh, and when we do workshops elsewhere, um, it's going to be on our website. So that's really the best way to find out what we're doing. Cool. Uh, we've tapered back a lot over the years, but we do take different engagements in different places. We've been starting to, we had stopped doing corporate stuff for a while, but we've been doing some of that again. So, yeah. Uh, and sometimes you, I know you'd go to Esalen and go to Esalen and there's a place in town called 1440, which we're talking about now, possibly doing something up there, which is a mindfulness center. Yeah. That's an, seems like a neat spot. I keep looking to be like, Oh, can I take a class there and go visit yeah. you at the same time? Yeah. 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 So that's exciting. So, Oh, that would be fantastic. Right. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah. So that's happening. So those are things that are happening in terms of my books. They mm -hmm. can go to cliffordhenderson.net and there are five novels there. And all of those novels to me, um, the one thing that I try and have happen in my books is that the protagonist, whoever they are, turns out to be a, like rises up to their highest self by the end of the book. I throw a bunch of difficult situations at them and I like to watch them rise to their highest self to, <laughs> to nice. deal with it. So yeah, yeah. that's kind of what those are about. Yeah. Very cool. So, yeah. Oh, well, thank you for being on the podcast. I know we kind of went back and forth and talked about it, but I'm glad that we made it happen even through our recording glitches and all of I know, the I know. <laughs> technical and, stuff. And sisters doing this parallel parallel uh, work uh, in different worlds kind of crazy it is it is and as i said i guess i hadn't really thought about how parallel it is but that's pretty <laughs> darn cool and maybe maybe this will be the episode that our mom actually listens to oh my god <laughs> <laughs> oh wow now we're setting the bar huh? <laughs> we'll see we'll call say jane if you're too, gonna tune in Right. This is the one to listen to. This is the one to listen to. If so, hi, Mom. <laughs> hi, Mom. <laughs> All right. Well, this was really fun, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. Yes, so soon. 
Okay. All right. All right. Thanks. Love ya. I really enjoyed talking to my sister, uh, Clifford Henderson, and I hope you enjoyed the conversation. As I said, I just was really kind of blown away by how parallel our career choices have been, how much our work mimics one another, and um, that's pretty cool. She's two years older than me, and uh, we have shared a lot of similar life experiences, obviously, being sisters, so interesting to see how that's impacted our adult lives, too. This episode was recorded before, really literally right before uh, COVID-19 became such an issue and was declared a pandemic or the coronavirus was declared a pandemic. So you would, if you live in the Santa Cruz area and want to know more about their classes, I believe they are beginning to offer some of them um, outside. So I know they had to stop for a period of time because of the theater being an enclosed place and it not being safe. But I think that they're just getting ready to gear up and start classes again. So that's exciting. I hope you'll check out her work, both the Fun Institute as well as her books. Her novels are awesome. So uh, you can find her novels on, I think, on her website too. I'll provide links to all her contact information in the show notes. I hope that you all have a wonderful week. I hope that you tune in to yourselves and do some mindful listening and communicating and eye contact this week. Ciao for now from This Woman Warrior. Thanks for listening and subscribing to The Woman Warriors podcast. Music was written and performed by Andy Cush. If you'd like more information on this episode, you can find the show notes, the resources shared today, and links to the guests' profiles at womanwarriors.com. Thank you.